<laughs> you know, we should start off the pods more often. Going, how have, how have you been, Richard? Let me ask you that. How, how? Why? Why would I? Why would I lie like that? Why? Because I genuinely don't care how your life has been. I mean, you don't want us to start off the podcast with a lie. These words are accepted. <laughs> Welcome, welcome everyone to the Tudor Ramble Podcast. My name is Richard. My name is Austin. And you're here for episode 57. Today we're covering Rhythm of War by Brandon Sanderson, the fourth book in the Stormlight Archive series. Long awaited one for this one. Well, not as much as people had to wait for our video on Oathbringer. I know Words of Radiance was the long gap. Oathbringer oh, we were okay, quick with. Oh, okay, gotcha. But we, have, we are now up to date by covering every Stormlight book. Very we good. covered one, two, three, and now four, and bet your ass we will be there <laughs> as soon as the fifth book drops. Now, little did you Ooh. know, the reason why we're doing all this is so that we get big enough that Dragonsteel will actually send us the fifth book early, and that would be just... Mwah. That'd be the best. Our channel has complete selfish motivations. We are oh, looking. Of course. We are sitting here so that one day Sanderson could sit across from me. We're not here to, sh you know, make other people's lives happier with some type of entertainment enjoyment, provide a community. No, we're here for getting early books. That's the whole part. That That's it, the whole purpose. And notice, I did say Sanderson will be sitting where you are because it's going to be a one-on-one -on -one uh, interview. Yeah. <laughs> You're going to take the back seat. It's going to be me and him having a little... I mean, a third mic would just be too expensive. It would. <laughs> Imagine that. <laughs> okay, I I'm pumped. Rhythm of War. Want to get? Let let's get into this because what we do with these reviews, the first 10 to 15 minutes will be spoiler-free, and then we'll get into spoilers. Yep. Just like all the previous ones. Hope you've seen those. If you haven't, we'll have some tabs up wherever it'll be somewhere yeah, we, up there. we did a deep dive into Sanderson. We did a review on all the yeah. other Stormlight books. Go ahead, check them out. All right, buddy. You ready? Yeah. The fourth Stormlight book... Before even giving the spoiler-free summary, before going and giving our rating, since this is book four, we can officially do this. What is your ranking of the four Stormlight books? This is actually a little hard for me. This Ooh. there's there's one. It sits on the lower end of the scale, but I'll I'll, I'll just give it. I'll give my rank. Stop tickling us. Just say it. At a number one, the best Stormlight book. Oh wait wait. Start you want one? Yeah, start the four. Make oh, it a little fine, bit. Make it fine. a bit climax. I kind of. I'm excited. You want the climax? Because here's All the right. thing. I know you're number one. I'm more excited to see what's three and four. Because it, I, I'm. Gotcha. It's a little murky for me. So what is it? I actually give barely, and I mean barely. Yeah. Rhythm of War number four, okay. then The Way of Kings, then Words of Radiance, and then lastly Oathbringer is the best Stormlight book. Oh, wow. And that's close. Wow. It, the, it honestly is a hard thing because there's a lot of positives to Rhythm of War that come. It actually fixes a lot of shortcomings that the uh, Way of Kings has, but also the Way of Kings has some stronger aspects to it that Rhythm of War is lacking. So it it really is a trade off. Well, it's tough when they're all great books. They right? are all really good books, yeah. but what, what, I said great. Why did you have to say really good? Why did you change the? I just why did you change the word? I have to be the, no, what the hell is to your that? yin. That's what I have to do. I can't let you get too comfortable with being happy. You always go one down from my superlative. So I'll say excellent, uh -huh. you'll say great. I'll say great, you'll say good. I'll say good, you'll say decent. It just keeps going <laughs> down the line. Hey, you do that with my favorite movies. I get to do that with your favorite books. Your favorite movie is Blues Brothers. Okay. And it's objectively it's, correct. It's not better than Lord of the Rings. It's just It <laughs> is. It's the best movie ever made. Fight me. I have. <laughs> we have Verbally, I, it's got, not gone physical yet. <laughs> and yet, I'm still correct. I, I still hold strong. But uh, instead of beating around the bush, you want to see how unoriginal hacks we are here at Two to Ramble? What? My ranking of the Stormlight books is number four, Rhythm of War. Number three, Way of Kings. Number two, Words of Radiance. And number one, Frickin' Oathbringer. So I have, yeah. I like to say you copied me, but you read them first. <laughs> so... <laughs> Uh, it's we have the same opinion. I waited. I waited about a year to read Rhythm of War because I was waiting for you to catch up. I was. I'm, I'm trying. I literally read all the way up to Oathbringer. Stopped. Re had Rhythm yeah. of War in my hand and stopped reading to wait for you. And I waited a whole year. But we got there. It took so long. It, it I did. Still, I had to give up on you for but, a time. But hey, let's not be too downer. Rhythm of War is our number four here. 
Oh, so yeah. it's still a really good book, but I have to say definitively for me, Rhythm of War is the worst Stormlight book. And by saying worst, it sounds like a bad word. Like, oh, it's the worst of them. It's mm-hmm. just the least best, I'd like to say. Well, because there, it's a real good book, but I think this one has the most, uh, most things that, I can't even, flaws to me. The, the least enjoyment while I still really enjoyed it. That's the best kind of me being... Me, I'm trying to use my words carefully so if Sanderson sees this before the interview, you know, I can oh, look back course. and say, look, yeah. Sanderson, I did clarify afterward that it's, like, not the worst worst. To be fair, I think our both of our biggest criticisms of the book, Sanderson himself actually has expressed uh, as he thinks it's the worst aspect of the book. Yes. So, Let, let's we'll, get into we'll that. We'll get into that. So Sanderson actually talked about how he thinks the worst aspect of this book is spoiler free still by the way we, we will warn you when yeah. spoilers are coming just general case. no specifics yeah but the the uh flashback scenes yeah were were the worst flashback scenes from the series mainly because just how they don't they really should have belonged in the third book but he couldn't fit them in the third book so they're in this book and there's just not there's no stakes there's no mystery, the mystery yeah yeah before in all the other flashbacks there was some sense of mystery that right. really kept you going and pulled you along. And in this one, there just isn't. I would go with a step further, and the characters in those flashbacks were just not as interesting as the ones we got previous. It would have been more interesting. Actually, I can't for spoiler sake. So let's, let's get into spoiler-free summary, then we'll get more specific about yeah. that so we can get to the people who have, have read the book. I would assume you yeah. clicked on a Rhythm of War video. Just, just in case. read the book. Just in case. I'm like, I'm... Four s- books into the series. Like, yeah. it's one thing, like, the first book of the series. Like, you okay, yeah, you accidentally click on it, maybe, you know? Well, you're interested. <laughs> yeah. Oh, maybe I want to read this book. This is the fourth book of the series. If you're if you're not reading it already, what are you doing here? Yeah, come on. Get on for it. <laughs> well, okay, spoiler-free summary. Just to get everybody up to date, this is spoilers up to Oathbringer, mind you. So mm-hmm. where did we leave off with Oathbringer? Was Dalinar saved everybody in Thalen Field? And he's got this whole unity thing going on. We have Kaladin who actually failed. And we have Shallan who's still dealing with her multiple personalities. And book four takes a one-year time leap from the end of Oathbringer with the Battle of Thalen Field. It's a one-year gap, which we'll get talking about in the plot and so forth. One-year gap. And this book, just like every other book, has flashback sequences and a main point of view. And in this case, it's Venli, the Parshendi Venli, sister or sibling to Shonai who died in, was it Words of Radiance, I believe, and the Words of Radiance. So it's Venli's flashbacks, and you also get a lot of Navani in this book. So it's, I'd say it's just as much Navani's book as Venli's. They probably have pretty on par point of views and a pretty good page time. But beyond that, we'll get right into spoiler-free rating. Unless you, did I cover mostly everything there? Yeah, simple, you, simple enough, right? Yeah. Okay. Spoiler-free rating, Richard. What did you rate Rhythm of War out of 10? Out of 10, gave it an average 8.30 out of 10. Very nice. Very nice. Respectable, Respectable score. score. We have a first here on Twitter Ramble, everybody. Are you guys ready for this? Book one, two, and three, I rated higher than you for mm-hmm. all the Stormlight books. Rhythm of War, I rate a 7.9 out of 10. The first one where you're lower than me. <laughs> Listen, the first, the first three Stormlight books exceeded all exceeded a nine for me. Every single one. Mm-hmm. This is the first one. It took a. I, I for me, there is a gap between four and three. There's a there's a gap between Rhythm of War and Wave Kings. My next favorite, a bigger gap than it would be for you. Yeah, yeah. I, I think there there are some genuinely like a third of the book. Way of Kings? In Way of Kings was not as enjoyable for me. With Shalon. With Shalon. It just, it didn't work for me when reading it. And I think there's some other aspects involving world building. However, with Rhythm of War, world building is really good. It's stepped up, yeah. improved. I love the, the structure, how it's telling the story. So the way it switches POVs, I think is far more enjoyable. You know what? I might there's not, ag- I might not agree with everything you said there. So we might have some we might have some oh, okay. good juicy good. stuff to talk about. This good. is good. Very good. Very good. Okay. And I can't believe this. I'm I'm finally going to be you and you're going to be me this episode. Great. Wow. <laughs> okay. That was spoiler free rating. Do we want to get into the big stuff? Wanna, yeah. Let's let's get spoilers into it. Spoilers warning. This is what you came for. You've been warned. Yeah. We're getting right into it. All right. It. Let's do this thing. So, right. overall rating we have now first category. 
of our rating system. By the way, if you want to check our rating system, it's in the description below on how that works. Basically, it's we have five categories. We divide them. So category one, emotional impact. What did you rate that out of 10? I gave it an 8.75. I gave it an 8.25. Very close. Very similar. Our ratings are also very close as well. This is going to be very yeah. minute. But why did you give it 8.75? What did you love about this book? I absolutely love Navani. Navani was a standout character for me in The Way of Kings, even though she shouldn't have been. You know, it, it's a very small character, but I just loved everything about her. And I was just kept waiting for more of her story, and this gave it to me. So, And, and additionally, not only did I really love Navani's character, but going beyond that, she explored the magic system of the world like how we have not seen before. And so that was just incredibly enjoyable to me. So, and then beyond that, the emotional journey with Kaladin. Oh, yeah. yeah. That threw me for a loop. Like, Brandon Sanderson really pushed our boy to a real low point. At lower than I think we've seen him before. And then let him rise. Sanderson, and that was such an yeah. emotional journey. And he was willing to actually go most of the book of... Kaladin's not being particularly exciting. It, he wasn't... Kaladin didn't have the exciting POV for most of it. But it definitely was the most emotional journey. Sanderson made depression depressive. Like, he made the, the depression itself even more depressing than depressing can get. It was bad. I mean, he beat you over the head. Oh, of it like, was... it sucks. It doesn't get better. <laughs> Just, <laughs> it wasn't like a low peak like it was a tiny valley and then rise mm -hmm. up it was low and straight then to the bottom plateaued at the valley until it, you could rise up yeah yeah so but it led to a, a really great emotional payoff so i do rate it quite highly for that so your kaladin and navani really led that score yeah and not only that i think adeline did a really good job not oh, as so. not as well i think as we could be but i really liked him and his uh, Maya, yeah, Maya. I liked that. I thought that was re like Maya's scene was really emotional. Mm. I really liked that. Shalon is probably the an interesting one. I liked almost all of her scenes up until the uh, ending. Yeah, tell I me thought about that. Tell me about that. I just thought the ending was rushed. It felt so strange. It felt like everything closed up all at once, and all of the this whole journey was. Too quickly resolved. You know what I think it was, Richard? I think it was emotional whiplash. That's what I think it was. <laughs> and you know why I'm saying it in that tone? I, I heard another book reviewer say it, and I forget who. I wanted to give them credit. But you, you'll find it. I, I'll find some piece. As I was doing research to rejog my memory of Rhythm of War, someone used that term. It might have been Murphy. Murphy Napier. Yeah. But someone used the term emotional whiplash. It was exactly what I felt, too, with mm -hmm. Shalon at the end there of, wait a second, wait a second. Okay, that was a quick change there. But it... it I th I think you're definitely right because the turning point from the darkest before the storm and then rise formless the uh, formless yeah. which is supposed to be like that's supposed to be her darkest moment and then it's literally like a chapter later complete all of her problems like resolved base basically like not completely but that that whole problem is resolved that quickly so that emotional payoff didn't hit as much for you. Yeah, exactly. I'd agree with that portion. Everything you said, I agree. Cal's str strong point, really great journey. Navani's great. This book, I think. I don't think Adeline was as good as he could have been. I I love Adeline. And, I I love Adeline more when he's with Kaladin as well. So maybe that's part of it. <laughs> of they're just such a great duo, and them being yeah. apart for the majority of the book. It's like ah, but also the Shalon and Adeline were gone for all of part four, I believe, or all one part they were just missing entirely. Uh, mm. And I, I think it was part four. So they, they did a right, mostly great. I mean, a lot of hits. And I think the Todium, Odium, as Teravangian reveal, just the stakes have been raised, this book, which is a huge yeah. part of my emotional factor in this book, is after Oathbringer ends, we have Odium's kind of defeated. Dalinar, best Odium, you know, Odium's still, they've got the huge army, don't get me yeah, wrong. Yeah, no, it's still technically yeah. a big threat. Huge threat, but, but he feels a he little less a threatening, there, doesn't he? There's a, there's a little clink in his armor. He's yeah. already been bested once. Yes. He, you've seen him lose before, and so that just doesn't make him as... 
compelling. Compelling as a right? villain. And then the twist of now Teravangian, this really fascinating character that you've been following and has a twisted mind of it. He's very utilitarian. Uh, oh, yeah. wait, maybe that's the wrong word, but he's just trying to save Carbranth. The ends no, justify he, the means type of thing. Here's the thing. He is, util, he is utilitarian when he's incredibly smart, mm. and he is incredibly empathetic when he's, and, dumb. When he's yeah. dumb. And that's his biggest curse. Right. And him becoming Odium, seeing Cultivation, we'll get into all the world building when we get mm-hmm. to that category. But a huge part of my emotional factor of the stakes going into book five, like even though I rated Rhythm of War the lowest, still really good. Yeah. I am over the floor ready for book five. And a little snippet, Sanderson's mentioned that book five of Stormlight, he has had this in his brain since college for 20 something years, a huge plot point where he and his buddies were playing D&D and he had this D&D campaign have this tumultuous, huge, epic finale that he said, you know what, I'm going to use that for a book one day. And book five is what he's using it for. How freaking cool is that? That is really awesome. Yeah. How would it feel to actually be one of the players in Brandon Sanderson's D&D game and you're sitting there like sitting on that nugget of information of I know how book five's going to end. <laughs> and you know how much I'd be such a bad friend. I'd be like, Sanderson, if you don't pay me millions of dollars every year, <laughs> I'm telling everybody. <laughs> I'm, I'm ruined. <laughs> so that was a huge part of my emotional impact was the stakes being raised. But that's my second best part of the motion. Mm. I think that Rhythm of War, again, it's strange that I'm juxtaposing this with Rhythm of War being my least favorite, mm-hmm. but it has my favorite chapter in all of Stormlight. Which chapter was that? Chapter 80. And I know, I just said, the, like, yeah. what do you know about, like, what's chapter 80? <laughs> I don't know. Ch- I had it written down. I, I would not have yeah. known which chapter if I didn't research. <laughs> but chapter 80, the dog and the dragon. You remember? Do I need yeah, to say any more? That's a great, uh, the, it is the best wit story and honestly such a, rough rough moment for Kaladin and I I almost feel like that a wit coming in to give Kaladin just a moment of peace was Sanderson himself going like I'm being a bit too mean to Kaladin (laughs) right now it's it's real depressed like depresso right now and I'm gonna need to just give him a little break yeah where so like Robin Hobb Beats down her characters, but then never gives them a break. I think Sanderson has a bit more empathy for his characters. He gave them a little bit of a break. Just a tiny breather. A tiny breather. And what did it for me is just the, it's a short story, essentially, in this massive epic fantasy. And it's such a great story and message. And he says it so well. And it coming from Whip makes it even more charming and fun. Mm -hmm. But seeing Cal's reaction of, hey, you, you are... You're, you have such high expectations for yourself. You're trying to become something you literally cannot. You can't save everyone. It is the message of this, this story for Keldon. You can't save everybody. That's the fourth ideal for him. So you can't become a dragon. You, you can't fly. But you can train as the dog, and you can learn to write. You can learn to go down the, wet, the well. You can learn to have scales that flash to show your attention so that you still save the kid. Yeah. Sure, you didn't breathe fire and fly, but look what you've done. Man, what a great freaking message. And getting that from Kel, just... uh, I thought it was also such a good moment for Wit as well. We often see Wit being very... uh, A jovial manner. And even with Kel, like, for most people, he is a little abrasive in in his fun Wit-like way. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it's usually I, fun because it's against people we don't like, like other yeah. the high princes and whatnot. But even people we do like, he's joking. And yeah, he's, yeah, he's poking them. He pokes just about everyone, and he even pokes Kaladin before. He pokes Ruthar this this one with yeah. Yaz, that whole scene. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah. But this is, I think, very one of the very few moments we see Wit like really somber and mm. serious. And I, I think he realizes like that's not. You know, don't don't poke Kaladin at this point. He, he can't take it. Like, he doesn't need that. So it shows a lot of empathy from Wit. Wit's more serious moments are the best. And I oh, think yeah. you can even allude back to the end of Way of Kings, that chapter where Wit is explaining what makes things valuable, and it's who's the first. That that chapter sticks with me. It's who's the first to come up with something. It's not, it's the ingenuity. That's what's valuable. That was really interesting. I think he was still being very playful and whatnot, 
But yeah. when he gets all philosophical and meaningful, it, it it makes you really, really understand Wit and Hoyt. Mm-hmm. So yeah. emotionally, anything that lowered it for you before we move on to characters, anything significant to mention? Because I'm sure we'll mention it throughout the rest yeah. of this pod. But Overall, the, the things that lowered it for me was Shalon and Venli. I don't care about Venli's character at all. Like, yeah. zero, zero amounts, which is a real shame. Uh, the flashbacks, not nearly as interesting. Um, kind of a negative emotion was the few times in the flashback where we get a Shonai and going, ah, oh, man. Sanderson really shouldn't have killed a Shonai. <laughs> we really needed that character. I would much rather a Shonai being alive instead of Venley. I agree with you completely on that and as well as on Venley, but I did love the last chapter where the Stormfather showed mercy to a Shonai, and that was, yeah. that was a touching scene because it was a Shonai, you know? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> like, that, we wanted more from a Shonai. We, we got so yeah. connected to her. Was, is it Sh- are they both uh, women? Yes. Or, okay, they both are. And Ven, see, that's how much I, I was disconnected to Venley. I didn't. I, I don't know Venley that well. Yeah. I know a show night really well. So, yeah, I, I agree with you on the negatives there. And one also, we oh, both yeah. have one character we both felt pretty negatively about. We'll talk about that in characters. Yeah. But let's we'll, get right into let, it. Though. Let's get into characters. Um, the last emotional thing I want to mention that lowered it for me mm-hmm. is world building, which we'll get into at the end of this. Mm. So I'll, I'll, we'll talk about that in our world building category because that will be a whole freaking discussion. So let's get into characters. Gotcha. What did you rate characters out of 10? Characters, I gave it an 8 out of 10. 8 out of 10. 8 out of 10. I gave it 7.75. Right. So again, again. I'm, I'm, most of us are close, but mine are, wow, I'm more critical I don't know. on a Sanderson <laughs> novel. Wow. Whew. See, I really loved both Navani and... Um, Oh God, I'm terrible Cal? with names. No, uh, the... oh Ra- Raboniel. Raboniel, right? Yes. yes, I loved all that. I think their very characters good. were just such, especially Raboniel was such a very, such an interesting character. And Raboniel's daughter and her motivation. Oh yeah. Oh, I so, was, oh, what was her daughter's name? Ezra. I don't remember names okay. very well. Yeah. <laughs> Starts with an E, I think. I'll I'll be honest. I I've learned something about myself that I think other people, even when they come across a name they don't know or they try and sound it out, they have their own spelling into it. Yeah, yeah. Often, I come across a name in a book, and I, my brain doesn't even attempt to sound it out, and I just process that name non-verbally, non-audibly, and so when someone asks me, oh, what's that name? I can't tell you. I only recognize the name by sight. I see the name, and I connect it with a character, but I don't even attempt to sound it out, and so that's why I often can't tell you names of characters, but and- I recognize them when I read it. And when you hear it? No. Oh. Because I have not heard it. I've not heard it in my own head, and I've not heard it audiobook. So, like, oh. it's a visual-only name sometimes. Okay, so the excuses for you not knowing half of our friends, mixing up half <laughs> of our friend's name, you still call me Justin sometimes. That's a different problem. <laughs> That's just me being dyslexic. <laughs> Are you actually dyslexic? Just a tiny bit? I was told I was dyslexic when I was in, like, elementary school and you just and said no no I thanks. said no you said no thanks <laughs> and you so you are dyslexic but you just deny it yeah i i had i have terrible time spelling and memory oh my god you are the worst speller i try and i don't know if this is me being ableist but you suck at spelling dude you are god awful words don't make sense <laughs> <laughs> but it, it is it is neat that when you read names I think Sanderson has some of the best names in fantasy. So, regardless of not being able to remember all of them, I think we, we just had a little snippet from a video we did where we said Keldon's such a cool name to name your kids. Yeah. Venley's still a great name. Navani. All these are really... A Shonai. A Shonai. That's a- where does he come up with this? Hmm. No, like, answer it's, that. Tell me. You should know. Like, oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> like, like, I expect you to know. I, that, right? I mean, I know in Emperor's Soul, he got that from... Like that's most of the names there are inspired from a, a Asian background. Right. When he did research, I think he went to China for some period of time. Okay. And so he got names from there. Um, I'm not exactly sure where he gets the Parshman, uh, the Parshendi names, but the I believe the names from Roshar. I 
if I'm not mistaken, I think it's more Greek. I know the Aleth, the Alethi, yeah. are based on their culture. At least is based on Mongol Empire, Genghis Khan type culture conquest. It's probably where so, they get some names. So maybe he did a little bit of that and mixed in Mongolian plus. I'm not sure. Oh, fun fact! I think the Mongols at the time they were called the Tartars. I knew that because I was researching Marco Polo. That's that's a long aside, but <laughs> that yeah I think some Mongol Empire inspiration and that's all that's the extent I know. That'll be the question we ask him when he's here on Tudor Ramble, of course. <laughs> yeah, hey anybody yeah. Uh, anybody out there you want Brand Sanderson to be on Tudor Ramble? You can go ahead and tweet at him, <laughs> get him, you know, send him our way, please, please, please. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I'm with you on because we mentioned characters and emotional impacts. Navani, I'm with you on Cal. I'm with you on Rabonio, real good characters. I love diving into Navani, and I was actually thinking before before I talk about lower characters, and some of you will probably agree, maybe disagree with Navani. I was almost thinking it would have been cool if we got her her flashbacks, but the more I don't, the I more don't th- think there's much yeah, that we'd want to see. I thought that what we got in Rhythm of War from Navani was plenty enough, and what we saw in the prologue and her relationship with Gavilar was, and that's the king by the way in case you you know you're not good with names but that's the that was the king (laughs) i can get gavilar that that one you got that one (laughs) i got that one i got that one down so navani navani's relationship with with her husband there in the prologue i think told everything we needed to know about her backstory yeah i think doing any kind of further backstory with her would be more her relationship with gavilar and i think kind of combine I, i think it would add some type of conflict in the reader's mind when seeing like the relationship with Gavilar and then in the present day the relationship with Dalinar it would be weird I think watch book five be Navani's backstory yeah I wouldn't be surprised <laughs> but I, I maybe it's Seth it I'm pretty sure it's Seth so it could be I wouldn't be upset with Navani either but hey whoever it is as long as it's not Venley you can just <laughs> get Venley out of there I'm sorry so that's the one biggest flaw with this book and why it brings it so down is Venley's I'm just not interested and Venley. Yeah, it it's strange because there are characters something like even in the way of kings with mm-hmm. Shallon or Shallan, mm-hmm. even though it was not as good as the other characters, it's not that bad. I it wouldn't say it's negative at all, but I definitely dislike uh Venley's or I'm less interested in Venley's character than I was in Shallan's in the first book. And also right. Venley is the main point of view with the flashback sequences. Well, she's so also our main point of view for uh, the Parshendi. And yeah. That kind yeah. Of, it's her position in the story is a big one. Yep. She's supposed to show us the, the positive side of the enemy type mm-hmm. thing. Like, all the books up until this point, you had, you know, humans against the Parshendi and they are the enemy. Yep. And, the rhythm of war is supposed to show us, hey, look, there's not really an enemy. There's just kind of two sides to a conflict, and there are no real enemies other than odium, I guess. Yeah, and then there's the Voidbringers, and those are Parshendi themselves. The Parsh- yeah. There's going to be those three factions now sprouting into the book five, where mm-hmm. Venley's going off with uh, with Relaine. Oh no, Relaine, they ended up splitting ways, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Okay, but Venley is not the my least favorite character of the book. Oh really? Liren is. We agree. Yeah. We agree. Liren my, just... Most of so my notes... Cal's father, for, for those who aren't remembering it, but Liren is Cal's father, and he's my least favorite. At, in all my notes, it's just like, I'm going through, like, part one. Liren, it, Liren is annoyed. Like, I hate Liren. I, I'm just going through, like, let's see, more more Liren stuff of... Uh, Liren, uh, the lift inner... Oh, Liren is a POS. <laughs> Uh, Liren wants Cal to turn Kaladin in. F Liren. I, I'm just. <laughs> I'm, I'm gonna make those a are all my notes. Bold claim. Liren is worse than Moash. Oh yeah, no. I said it. I I dislike Liren way more than Moash. Yeah, like Hot take. way more. It's just so frustrating because I don't know where he's coming from. I can't understand. Maybe there's some how, backstory to it. Sure, but, but it I can't empathize enough or understand enough to where why Liren is pacifist to the extent that he is okay with not that he's okay with he is so against all death to the point where Cal can't even self-protect and protect the people he's trying to heal it's to such an extreme extent of okay 
what are you doing about the opponent that's killing people? What what are you <laughs> literally what are you gonna do when the enemy soldier tries to stab your child? Are you just gonna go, well, that's it? You know, hey, why another child then? Because, you know, we can't defend our own. Yeah. What are you going to do? I couldn't understand. It's so spineless. Yeah. It it really is worse. Like, an actively worse world. But it's not just Lyric himself. It's how other people treat him. I I think that Lyric's position is so outrageous and so actually antagonistic. Like, almost worse than an enemy. Like, with allies like Liren, who needs enemies. But how everyone treats him, they need to treat him much harsher. I get to a certain degree Kaladin wants his father's approval, but Liren's wife, who clearly is annoyed with him at some points, but doesn't... I, I, I would say she needs to be a little bit more forceful with her opinion of him. Anyone around him, why does anybody respect this man? That, that was the worst part because it, obviously the critique on the character isn't that he's making because it's good if I'm frustrated at a character I'm supposed to I think that's mm-hmm. a good well written character just why Liren didn't do it is because I'm looking for other characters to show why he's so wrong or if he does have a point give more backstory to Liren like hey maybe he his father his brother in the past there's something so traumatic and you could connect with just something there and it's just such a disconnect to why Liren is the pacifist to the stupid extreme yeah, and uh, it, it, let's say it's even there in the real world. There's pacifists that are to that extreme, but you understand more about who the. It's a religion. It's a, it's the foundation to their culture. There's a lot of reasons. With Liren, it's a disconnect, and the characters that interact with him, as you were getting at, you want them to say something more forceful. Of hey, can someone else in the book point out how stupid this is? Can can <laughs> someone around Liren go, Liren, you're being an idiot? And I I realize Hasina, his wife. They have a scene with that, with with the glyphs, and he, remember the glyph scene. Go, go on with that because oh, I know I, you want. I reread yeah. that scene specifically of like I wanted a good cathartic Tell moment. Me. Yeah, the glyph scene. Remind but, people. Yeah, so in the glyph scene, uh, Liren's Liren's wife. Could you remind me her name? Asina. Asina. I just listened, Hasina. but you don't Thank listen you. to me I, enough. You just. I don't. I, I make an active choice. Maybe you don't have dyslexia. Maybe you just are mean. <laughs> <laughs> so, but Hasina basically. Uh, sh- forces Larry to sit down and say, look at all of these people wearing the glyph of your son. Why do you think they're doing that? And he's just grumbling of, oh, they're a bunch of idiots. And, you know, it's just going to get more people killed. She says, you already sort of agree that fighting, like, soldiers, there has to be soldiers. Like, fighting to a certain degree is necessary. Like, you can't just not fight ever. Mm. Which one we don't really hear from Lyra, and we hear that from her, and I'm like, oh, that's a first. But then he he grumbles about it, and she tells him, "Who would you rather have as a soldier? Some bloodthirsty person who enjoys fighting, or would you rather have someone like your son, who you taught to care, who you taught to try really hard to preserve life? Which do you think is the better soldier? Which which soldier would you rather have walking out there?" And, you know, more grumbling from Liren. <laughs> Basically, she forces him to go to every single patient and ask, like, why do you wear that glyph? And based on how Kaladin has done more for the people in, in Roshard than Liren ever has. What Oh, what a touching scene with... I, I don't remember the character that Liren spoke with, but he was basically saying, hey, the Ardents couldn't help me. The the healers couldn't help me. I, I've been to war and I've been through some crap. You think the you think the religious people here or the doctors could fix what was wrong with me? No, but I look at Kaladin. I look at Kaladin and how he, what he's gone through, and he's still able to walk. If he can do it, Jesus, any of us losers can. And Kaladin's a face of hope for all of us. What a great scene! Mm. And that it that was a great scene. Maybe uh, hey, to Sanderson's credit, he wrote Liren in such a way that it made that scene great. Yeah, but I guess our biggest complaint is it's. We don't understand Liren enough to where we can go. Oh, okay. This is why he's yeah. being such, uh, such conflicting with his own son to the point of you're no longer my son for going into the army and trying to save Tien, my other son. Like, cut you. Just I needed more explanation. That's all. Yeah, for that kind of decision, like he's an actually bad father. Mm. He, he is an he is a bad father, a bad husband, mm-hmm. actively bad person. Yeah, and. The world does not treat his decisions as such. Um, 
my, not really spoilers, but an example of if you've read Wheel of Time, you're about to. There are There is a group that is pacifist to that extreme. Mm. That's a thing. But the difference in that story is they are given the consequence. One, you understand why okay. they are the way they are. You also see the consequences of their actions. People treat them also with a pr- appropriate uh, appropriate attitude of like, Got it. your guys are idiots. <laughs> <laughs> and they suffer consequences, real consequences gotcha. for their beliefs. And it just makes far more sense to their level of pacifism, where Liren just does not. And not to continue the train, I'll, I'll bring some levity first, because we're, we focused on our two least favorites, which were Venli and uh, and Liren by far. So on the positive side again, who, who would you say like Rabonio and Navani? Throw in another big one. That, who else worked for you here? I mean, of course, Kaladin, and yep. I really liked um, Maya, the the broken or the dead Spren. Spren. Yeah. I thought that was such a good emotional scene, and you see good. little tiny bits of her character. It's, it's uh, you see a lot of you see a lot in a very little, with her character. Very neat. And so I really enjoyed seeing her kind of struggle to do, just minute tasks and really stand by Adeline in certain moments. Yeah. So I I I love that. I'm hoping to see a lot more of her in the fifth book. But other than that, Teft was really well done. Yeah, All the yeah. characters oh, there. David, right? David. Yep. David. So there's a lot of real solid characters, and, of course. And even that, the new the new Spren, the Spren of the Tower, I thought was really good. And all her its interactions with uh, Navani was mm-hmm. great. So tons of stuff with them. Yep. Dalinar, we don't get much of. Yeah, Dalinar, we don't get much of. And the most disappointing part of that story with Dalinar isn't Dalinar, but I think this goes in characters. Mink, the Mink. Not yeah. a lot happened. The Mink was introduced in the beginning. This is the the leader of the Herdas Her, people, and has a really quirky personality at the beginning of just escapes mm-hmm. all the time. And I thought that would get used in the plot later. I don't think it did. I don't think that was used again as a plot point. Um, I don't think so. I expect it to be. It doesn't have to be. I, it kind of was a, a foreshadowing something was going to happen there. But then the Minx whole story was just he was helping as a general, and I'm I'm sure book five will have some important factor with it. But in this book, I was just, oh, I, I almost forgot about the Mink when we were reading this again to review for doing the pod. I was like, oh, that's right. There was the Mink. Who was that? And then I had to... Yeah. Did you get the same feeling? But like, what, I did. Go? Yeah. I, I just think all the stuff with Dalinar was just not really well juggled with the book. There was so little of it and not as impactful, even though there's some scenes in there that plot-wise are very important. Yeah. So it was strange. There, wasn't, there just wasn't enough interest, interesting stuff with Dalinar. To the put the icing on the cake, because uh, mm-hmm. to go positive against sandwiching this, I think that the Spren, Pattern, and Sill were the best they've ever been. You get a lot Definitely. of great stuff. Pattern gets more fleshed out than you, than Pattern has ever been. And Syl showing how we get some insights onto her previous night's Radiant. And she goes through a bit of depression. And she's trying to help Cal and goes and talks with Dalinar. Mm-hmm. Get some great scenes with the Spren. Yeah, yeah. no, I think we're, we harp on the negative so much just because there is a lot of good. And other than saying, like, hey, all this stuff is great. And we have such a high bar for stormlight that when there's a negative comes up that's yeah. the more interesting thing to talk about oh exactly like kaladin being great is not status anything quo. So like, that's <laughs> yeah that's that's what i expect kaladin to be great he's and been he is, great yeah. all the way through yeah. so i mean there's not much else to say about that yeah. versus something just not adding up with like shallan like shallan has been great for like both words of radiance and oathbringer Fantastic, fantastic characters. Which a lot of people don't agree with. A lot of people are annoyed by Shalon. I don't see it. I, yeah, I don't I, either. I, this book, she's definitely not the best in Rhythm of War. Takes a step down. But where's Radiance and Oathbringer? I, I, go on to say what you're saying. Yeah. Oh, no, yes. One, vitally important to the story, exploring the world. You see more of the world with her. I think her, her character flaws and her struggles are really interesting. Mm. So, and also, the romance with Shalon and... Adeline's actually good, like good romance in a fantasy book. Yeah. That's rare. 
and, and dealing with multiple personality disorder. It's really, yeah. it's, it's so fascinating. And she has a deep, deep troubling past of mm-hmm. at her flashbacks in Words of Radiance. What what a reveal as well. But let's you know we talk. We had a whole yeah. Words of Radiance plot. Let's let's go into plot. Let's do plot. All right. <laughs> what what's your rating for plot out of ten? Um, well, actually, before we get into that oh. one, oh, uh, you know we. Okay. You guys have been watching, if you've been watching this long, uh, I imagine you, you like listening to what we have to say. If you want to hear more about what we have to say about other books and you want to support our channel, you can actually check out our Patreon down below where we have a private Discord for all Patreon subscribers. And we talk about a book a month and we have a you know book of the month for book club. And we also do uh, once a month a movie watch party. So you can watch, react, and it's a lot of fun. We also do some game nights. It's a cool community to be a part of, and it supports the channel here. And we hang out with all you guys, so we're doing the book club with you. Of yeah. course, that's part of it. And we reinvest all that back into the channel, getting editors and do whatnot. So yeah, go check that out. Thanks, guys. All right, now let's get into plot. What okay. did you rate the plot out of 10? I gave plot a 7.5 out of 10. What did you give plot? Okay, I gave it an 8.75. Eight. Oh, I'll be big honest, difference. Now, more more we've talked, I'm tempted to lower that score a bit. Shoot, okay. I'm actually okay. tempted to lower it uh, to a significant margin, mainly because What do you think, sub-8? Sub-8, or does it still stay 8? I think sub-8. Oh, hey, join me at 7-5. How about that? <laughs> <laughs> you know, get some li- live editorial reactions. Oh. I think I will actually lower it to a 7-7-5. Okay, what's that change to your total? We'll, we'll calculate. We'll it calculate afterward. at the end. Okay, but okay. So yeah, yeah we're very close then on plot. More, more. I think about it with Dalinar, especially how little it really connected well with the story. Venli's connection. There's a lot of holes, and then with I think the biggest fumble would be um, the plot line with Sh- Shalon and how her storyline. Real quick, co- you know, caught right together. It it was way too quick. Hey, it wasn't about. I, I rated plot lower than you. And I just want to, I just want to jump back with a huge positive because again we have high expectations for Sanderson. Yeah. With a huge positive of I'm mentioning this in emotional impact category. Mm-hmm. How freaking hyped we are for book five because the stakes were raised. That's the, I think that's the best part mm-hmm. about this plot is Teravangian becoming Odium and also figuring out a lot about the magic system which we can get into as well. But the the stakes being significantly raised he effectively did that with the book four because i can see it gets tough when you're in book four of a series and mm-hmm. you can't wrap everything up in book four you're you're yeah. you're building a crescendo to get to the next book that a lot of the times that happens in book threes but sanderson really pulled off book three for us so raise the stakes significantly and has me super excited to read on that's the best thing I could say about the plot. Well, definitely going into it, it feels weird. There's this state of calm of like things are just going to go as they are. Like the conflict's going and it's never ending, but there's no real threat of Odium taking over completely. Yeah. And that so that threat is gone and it's weird. It's a weird feeling in the beginning of the book. Mm-hmm. But then by the end with the change with Odium now uh, being Taravangian, all of those stakes have been just raised so much. And mm. it led to a very interesting story where, where there's no longer the threat of annihilation looming over everyone's heads. Mm-hmm. So that's not really there. There's a lot of more personal threats. There's, you know, oh, we may lose the city, but we're not going to lose humanity. Humanity's not going anywhere at this point. All right. That's an odd thing to be able to juggle and then still raise the stakes beyond that. And going into book five, they're now far more personal stakes with our favorite characters is an interesting direction. Most fantasy series will always end with, you know, annihilation is the threat. You know, the the Dark Lord's going to kill everyone. Not so, I think, in this one. That's not really the threat. It's a far more personal stakes. So, barely impressive. It- a very personal stakes, and would you would you say there's another thing you really loved about the plot before we kind of you know hit hit some of our negatives on it? Um, I mean, I loved everything with Devani. Yep, yep. Devani's plot, I think, to me was perfect. Got it. I, I wouldn't change a single thing. I I loved the pacing of it. I loved all the exciting stuff we learned about the world and the magic, and then all the banter back and forth. Wonderful. I wouldn't change a single thing with that. Awesome, awesome. Now now to get more negative, what was what you like? A little bit less about this time with the plot. I mean, 
I guess it would be some of the juggling of POVs. So mm. this is a double-edged sword. So before would in you previous say pacing books, is a big part then? Pacing, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So I really liked, I thought I would like how the previous books, they have one chapter per POV. And often that it's, so you can go a lot of chapters without seeing your favorite character again. Yeah. Where in Rhythm of War, you're jumping back and forth between POVs yeah. all the time. That there's no like Kaladin chapter. There's just all the POVs going on at once. And I kind of, I thought I would like that when I was reading it. It definitely kept me more engaged in the moment. But overall, it seems like it kind of hurts some of the pacing. Where maybe I would have enjoyed Dalinar's side if I just got like a solid five whole chapters with Dalinar. You know what I mean? Instead of like we, a couple paragraphs in you. and in there, you know? Yeah. I, I'm, I, it's such a big book. There probably was five chapters with Dalinar. I don't know. Oh, no. With Dalinar? <laughs> certainly. Yeah. Just from his perspective. Dedicated. Just got it. Because there's a real difference between a where before like a Kaladin chapter where the whole chapter is Kaladin. Mm. The whole thing is only his POV. By the way, his plot is basically Die Hard, which is cool. <laughs> yes, yes. So always great for fantasy Die Hard. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, I think that kind of juggling, while in the moment I liked it, maybe that led to some pacing issues mm. when looking at it as a whole. Yeah, I I follow that as well. I think this one had the biggest pacing issues. Sander Lanch was still a great Sander Lanch, but Whiplash with Shal- Shalon's perspective. And I gotta say, it was... I have two two things to say on this <clears throat> for plot aspect. One, it had some of the more predictable elements to me with the mm. whodunit wasn't that interesting. It wasn't... That, it was it was all right. It was all right. You know, if I'm putting it to the high standard, it was it was fine. And Teft dying, although, you know, it was Teft, my boy Teft. It was. You, you did... It, you it was, saw it It was coming. good, but you saw it coming because his, his arc was over. I, mm-hmm. If there was, if Sanderson pr- surprised us a little bit more and gave a little bit of subterfuge, or I don't know what the word is. I was trying to be smart, but what subterfuge I, is the word you're looking for. But I don't know if it's the correct word to use because it isn't that like a tactic where you're you're looking tricking your enemy or something. So you're looking for a red herring. It, he should have added yeah, yeah, a yeah. red herring, something to like that. Throw yeah, yeah, good word, good word. So something like a red herring that was going in a different direction. Or, I, I don't know. So that was a little predictable, and although the Maya payoff with Adeline was still, you know, but you did see it coming. You knew it was building up toward Maya speaking. That it, it couldn't go any other way. And yeah. I want to give credit again because I think Murphy also said that in her video because I watched her review right before this, and I agreed with a bit of what she said. So generally predictable. That's not a bad thing. It's just, it's it's a thing the state She's not is, as exciting. Yeah, as it not could be. not as exciting. But I think the. Uh, one of the lower parts about the plot, and again, still a good plot, but you know, there's the pacing issues and whatnot. But the the uh, this is more for world building when we talk about that. But the story almost felt a little smaller. Mm. We were confined to some places, and clearly that that's the plot that was decided. You know, you have your hero, your plot. That I give it more of a negative factor because it's book four, where the. Oathbringer leads off with we're just getting more from uh, from uh, Thalen Thalen City. We're getting more from uh, uh, Azir. We're we're now starting to expand the world, and this will get into world building. But the plot then seemed really confined, which could work for some people. The whole diehard aspect with Cal, I get it, but it was more negative for me because we're four book. This is book four, and I was really getting into the. I was looking for the expansion more in the plot of get, mm. getting everywhere. And I just felt like, you know, Navani and Cal's who were the main perspective of the novel with Venley. Oh, besides Venley, we had Cal and Navani were the big leads here or in your theory, like the whole time, except for the very beginning where that her, her dad's mission. But did you feel the same or am I rambling off of something that was, uh, just, no, just I actually off? think we can go. Let's before we get into prose and dialogue, yeah. let's actually, jump right into world building okay let's we'll, we'll end with prose dialogue okay yeah so right into world building i gave it an 8.5 8. 5 here okay i gave it a 7.75 i actually really enjoyed the world building of this book more so than the other books mainly because wow in the previous books like yes there are different locations and but i honestly i can't remember a single name of one of the other locations or one of the reasons why their cultures exist and they don't seem that impactful. It's just not as relevant to the story to me. Where this book goes into the magic system 
far deeper. You get to see the culture of the Voidbringers in a far deeper way. That you always see that they're like the enemy, but now you see why they act the way they do, what are their goals, what are their different missions, how they're actually fractured, they're not a cohesive unit. You get to see how Parshman civilizations react, and so you get to see a vastly different culture. It, way better than in any of the other books, and it's far more impactful. So I think getting the Parshman's culture and values right is way more important than getting, like, say, Azir, like the country. I, I think that's the name, right? Mm -hmm. Azir? Yeah. Phase Azir does, doesn't matter. Like They ultimately don't matter to the story, but the Parshman definitely do. So you get far more of a deeper dive into the cultures that matter. You get a deeper exploration of a hard magic system. You get to see so many cool new things you could do. And you see how the future of Stormlight Archives is going to be a sci fantasy, which is so much fun. So I really enjoyed the world building in this story. The best part about the world building, I agree with the magic system. Mm -hmm. The magic, so the magic system slash world building, we rate those in the same category. I think all the accolades for me go to how cool the magic was. And I'm not the most, uh, I don't love reading the very specific drawn out magic as much as other readers do like you. I love yeah. it. I, not, <laughs> I love the breakdown of yeah. how the technical The, the sounds works. and so forth was yeah. cool. Yeah, I, I get that. I but loved it. Yeah, yeah. So <laughs> I, I see why you rated it higher there. So I'm not, uh, I, I like a lot of what happened there is I also focus on mysteries. I always like when like maybe 75% is explained to me. And this one felt like 95% was explained to me. So okay. he kind of went so specific to the magic that it almost lost a little bit of the mystery. Mm. Terrell was going, all right, that's explained really well. That's some hard magic. <laughs> <laughs> and don't get me wrong, hard magic is cool and all. But even when you have Avatar The Last Airbender, it's hard magic. But, you know, no one... Y y at least, you know, let's not go into the lower past core and whatnot, just talking about the show. Still a mystery of, ah, how, yeah. how do people bend? Where did that come from? But you know people bend. This is how they bend. So with Stormlight, a lot of that mystery was answered. A lot of it was answered, which is cool. Uh, just I wanted a little bit more mystery leaving at the end. I, I, I'm a fan of that. There's okay. definitely a higher mystery. So, like, exactly yeah. how it works with the surges and mm -hmm. the spren, a lot of that was answered. But I think so many more questions came up about investiture in total. So on a higher like, cause too, level, right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. Like totally, how totally. do as how do these different magic systems interact with each other? Investiture. How does the the, the celestial powers the the I try to remember the names the, the shards mm -hmm. that it's the god shards effectively of how these powers actually interact and how a sentient being can take god's power. Yeah. All of this oh, higher level stuff, yeah. I think there's a ton more mystery there. Where we, yeah, we've solved some of the mystery on the stormlight surges, mm -hmm. but now on a higher Cosmere level, there are a lot more questions and have opened. Yeah, up. like all the Terravangian stuff. Like what what is going on there? Yeah. Totally, totally. But even stuff with the Spren. How the yeah. hell did Spren that should only manifest in the um? The cognitive realm. Oh, with how are they? Yeah. How mm -hmm. the hell are they in the physical realm? Mm -hmm. And so what's going on there? It, that has so many more implications. So I do think there's a lot of questions that open up in this book. Fair enough. Fair enough. I guess uh, for, for you, which question to you is the most you're looking forward to in book five to get answered? Specifically on magic system. Oh, man. I think I would love to see more about the spread. Oh, can I jump right in with you there? Yeah. Because one big thing that was answered in Oathbringer, the biggest thing for me in book one was what, what the Knights Radiance do. And that was answered, I think, in Oathbringer. And we started getting gradual and gradual answers. And I'm the next big question then, spren-wise, I think I'm with you. on what Because now we're, we know a lot about Shadesmar. A lot, but also a little. And go off with, with the spren. What were you about to say there? Oh, yeah. I, I'm just fascinated to know what exactly the Spren's nature is, mm -hmm. what what's kind of their purpose in this in this kind of world and their interaction. So their cultures are now further delved into what is the reason why they're actually bonding men in the first place. Mm -hmm. It seems like a lot of hassle that why are you doing it in the first place? Um, honestly, I just want to know more about them. Gotcha. So we got a lot of it in this book, but I just want more. Got it. Okay. And then for, so magic wise, 
good. good. I mean, really well done, dr- uh, explained. A little bit too much explanation for me, but I see what you're saying with mm-hmm. the mysteries, how it's a larger Cosmere-esque mysteries. So there's still yeah. a lot to look forward to. Don't get me wrong, exactly, but, yeah. Um, it, and the the thing that really negatively impacted world building for me was the world felt smaller. Mm. And the focal point of book four was in Yurithiru for the most part and very little outside of that. And so Mm -hmm. when I was looking for the story to expand and get more epic and to start to understand more about the other cultures and the, the, the world itself, it felt like we took a step back or at least stayed the same for this book going into book five. I do you feel? I would agree with you. It took a step back and went far more narrow, but I, I thought this was more significant world building than, Oathbringer, Words of Radiance. You rated of Oathbringer higher, world building. Yeah, I did. You gave that like a 9.25. Yeah. I'll, I'll amend it then. I will say for Words of Radiance and Way yeah. of Kings, the main reason the big push in world building is the Parshendi and the Voidbringers. Mm. I thought that was vitally important world building that was handled very well in this book. So w- not only do we get to find out some of the reasons for why they are at war <laughs> what what why would they choose odium why are they on their side that they're actually fractured and how they have different personalities and the suffering that they're kind of going through themselves mm-hmm. and it's such an interesting perspective that they have and especially how the void Brokers can't die and so how does that change battle tactics and how how does that affect their psyche really interesting stuff that i was way more excited to see that than say some other city in roshar I guess our biggest difference when we get to world building too is in the previous books, uh, we, I think we agree on Oathbringer. In mm-hmm. the previous books, I think, uh, and this is what Rhythm of War does as well, I love to get the essential world building to what's needed of our characters. And obviously in Rhythm of War, they're in your theory. So of course you shouldn't find out what's in Aesis. I was hoping the plot took a different direction where mm-hmm. we would learn more about the world. Of course, I don't need to know about Az- Azir if we're not in Azir and nothing's going on there. Or that's yeah. why we know nothing about Shinovar. Well, not, we're not there. We don't need to know what's going on. So my the world building connects with the plot of they stayed in Urethiru. There wasn't the world didn't mm. expand. And then on top of that, uh, you you were saying something on. Oh, I lost my train of thought. You you had a point you made, and I was like that. that was, I was going to say that's a good point. I was talking yeah. about the importance of knowing the culture from the Parshendi. Oh yes, the Parshendi. Yes. So where I agree and disagree with you is the culture is interesting but when I read a book I'm very character centric and we learned about the Parshendi through Venli's eyes so the although the culture is interesting and everything I found the Parshendi more interesting with a Shonai's perspective and the mysteries there and so when we read when we read Way of Kings and Words of Radiance and seeing that through a Shonai's perspective and them speaking a different way it was mistake mm. again I'm a big I'm big on mystery I, I like when there's some things not explained. And so the Parshendi speaking the way they did and slowly learning. I, I can't pick my brain of like what reveal happened in which book because it all fuzz, it fuzzes together. But you get what I mean. Whereas with this book, seeing the Parshendi's culture, although interesting, from Venli's perspective, I was less emotionally invested in the culture. Because I'm mm-hmm. going, eh, okay, I just want to get through this Venli chapter. So when I'm learning about the culture, I'm okay. going, all right. And so then when I'm learning about the interesting characters to me, like Navani or Cal, they're in your theory, and I already know about your theory. What else is there to know? So the world just felt smaller. And although at the end, what Sanderson does fantastically is makes it bigger by having that Cosmere level stake that you're very good to note with, yes, hey, Terra Vanjie, and that's my favorite part about the plot, is that the stakes are raised and there are those higher level mysteries. So I'm totally looking forward to that. But if I could summarize my world building in just like two words instead of rambling, you know, TM, <laughs> instead of rambling, it's the the smallness that we didn't expand physically with the world and the perspectives we got in the cultures were from characters' point of views that I wasn't as invested in. So, Fair enough. I, I guess I, I did not, I did not mind seeing, even though I didn't like Venley's character as much, I still enjoyed a lot seeing the parchment's culture i could see that but instead of being civil you bastard you're wrong (laughs) (laughs) you're see you're you're now trying to take my perspective you're trying to take my role as being the pessimistic antagonist i am yeah i I just don't do a good job at being an asshole i guess (laughs) 
<laughs> See, I'm far more nuanced in my assholery. I, I like to pick it apart and be tactful with it. Yeah, me, I just go to name calling. <laughs> so, like, okay, want to move on to Dialogue Pros? Yeah. Okay, Dialogue Pros, what did you rate it out of 10? I gave it a 7.5. 7.5. So okay. With our talk about pacing. Mm-hmm. I'm wondering if that should factor into that score. I may be willing to lower that one as well. Okay. But I think dialogue-wise, it was really well done. Uh, especially, you talk about the the side story, the, the story of the dog trying to become the dragon oh, yeah. with wit. Great storytelling. I think a lot of Sanderson's writing was spot on in this book. So... Great poetic stuff. I, I am an anomaly with Sanderson's prose, it seems like, from the majority of people. So I gave this an 8.25, mm. which is actually my lowest for prose out of all of the Stormlight books. Mm. I still think it's great. I, I love, and we've talked about this in the past, of Sanderson is not writing to impress you poetically or purpley. He is writing efficiently and so that you understand and you are engaged and it really gets you. I... I I rate someone when I rate him by his intent. What is he trying to do with his prose? He is trying to make it a fascinating. You don't have to read the same paragraph twice. You understand the words you're going forward, and he throws in really great descriptions, analogies. He does a great, great job to where for a book this thick, if you were to fill this in with all this poetic language, all this Tolkien BS, I can't believe I just said that. I love you, Tolkien, so much. I, I, I take I take back every word. I love, like Lord of the Rings is obviously written better. Tolkien's the GOAT, yeah. obviously. But would, for Sanderson's intent yeah. to get you to read a thousand-plus page book, it already takes so long to do, and he, he makes it so that if this was purple prose, how are you going to get through that? You're, it's it's going to be too dense and too much and also it'll take him too long to write I, I think he's doing exactly the right thing and it's so great to read mm. so I think you would actually it would be very interesting to hear your thoughts on something like Name of the Wind where it's not the Tolkien level of be- beautiful you poetic mean perfection. stuff yeah perfection yeah, yes yeah. it's not that <laughs> it's, it's not the kind of rhythmic but yeah. the pros are certainly better than Sanderson's in terms of like I'm not having to reread paragraphs, like because I don't understand. It's just written beautifully. beautifully oh, I don't doubt throughout you. the yeah. whole thing. So like, yeah, I don't doubt. Even though, but I, then again, that's I why I that's, dislike the book. But like, I actually hate the storyline, the characters, and everything. But I can at least admit, damn, the book's writing's good. But do you think that's why it's taken him over a decade to write his next one? Oh, definitely <laughs> has to be. Well, so, I, th- I think he also has some plot problems where he probably. wants it to be. Like he said, it's three books, and apparently he has way too many, like, plot ends that he can't wrap up in one book. Uh, it's gonna take two books, and he wants to do it in one. Oh, okay. He's gonna have to write a Sanderson book. <laughs> yeah, I know. A long, long book. But with Dialogue Pro still giving it the eight point two five, I gave the previous three books mm-hmm. way overnight, like nines and nine fives. That's how much I I love and go for the intent of what he's doing. I I rate it for. I don't judge a a black and white a movie for not having color yeah you know what I mean like if it's shot in the 1950s like oh not enough CGI for me just like oh Sanderson you don't have enough X Y Z he's not going for that he does it nearly perfectly for what he's going for like I can only and the reason I gave this an 8.25 a bit lower than the previous ones is there some of the humor didn't hit for me as much I just remember Mm. I remember while reading I can't point out a line obviously but I remember while reading some of the lines back and forth, especially in Shadesmar, didn't laugh when it wanted to make me laugh. So, you know, it has to affect what I put with the, uh, with the you know, the, the prose didn't work in a way that it, what it intended to do. For the most part, though, has the best chapter in Stormlight, chapter 80, The Dog and the Dragon, which I think is absolutely stunning and written super well. And he has so many, it, it, again, he just keeps up the efficient, really great to read, pleasurable stuff. I certainly cheered when Kaladin got the, when he swore the fourth ideal. Yes. I, yeah. I did actively cheer. Yeah. Uh, uh, so almost every time with a Sanderson book, I actually out loud cheer yep. for a moment. And so that definitely has to go to a positive to his writing and his prose. That yeah. he, makes, can he, he can make it that exciting. And now I think we should take the inspiration of uh, recently on this channel, we reviewed a really bad article that attacked Sanderson. Mm-hmm. And it was called Brandon Sanderson is your God. Right. So yeah. now, Richard, I want you to take out your inner 
your inner Brandon Sanderson is your God and say the worst thing you can about Rhythm of War. Like, <gasps> no, no here, here's oh. what I mean. Don't sugarcoat it. Just be like, hey, I'm going to say one thing about Rhythm of War and it's okay. the worst thing I can think of. Kaladin's father, Liren, is a worse person than Moash. Yeah, that was pretty bad. <laughs> now, on the flip side, on the flip side, I want you to be the opposite of that article and say the best thing you possibly can about this book. Brandon Sanderson, with the Stormlight Archive series and the fourth book following, has touched so many people's lives on everyone is on the edge of their seat waiting for the conclusion of book five and that's because of this fourth book this whole series is he brand sanders has done for reading what so many so many people like uh george lucas has done for films and all the people in the fantasy reading community it, it's amazing seeing all of his fans at conventions and seeing the support that he's got online Within our kind of small, smaller circle and niche of fantasy reader fans, he really is a superstar. And Stormlight Archive really proves it. That was touching, dude. That was touching. Now I'm going to ask one more question. Oh, with all your questions. And I'm going to ask it to myself. Uh huh. Hey, Austin, how's your day going? Well, you know, it's going pretty good. I don't get it asked often by Richard. So, you know, I just had to ask myself, you know, I, I woke up this morning, had a nice, had a nice shower, ate some nice food. And then I came and did this pod with someone that I still hate to this day. <laughs> so that's how my day's been. <laughs> you know, we should start off the pods more often and going, how have, how have you been, Richard? Let me ask you that. How, how? Why, why, would I, why would I lie like that? Why, cause I genuinely don't care how your life has been. I mean, you don't want us to start off the podcast with a lie. These words are accepted. <laughs> uh, thank you guys so much for watching. And... When the fifth book comes out, we'll do that. Hopefully, we'll do some more books here coming on. But if you got all the way to the end here, um, just for a little fun, how about uh, put in the comments down below what's something good? Leering. Just say, ah, uh, no, not that. Le not, no? No, no, no. Let's, no, let's, no, no. Get, let's get creative. Get creative get with creative. it? Get okay. creative. How about you say... Um, uh, oh, here we go. Moash is greater than Leering. Put that in the comments if you got all the way to the end. Here. If you're willing to. Now, people might not want to do that. <laughs> you know, See, you, I'm making them do it you now. Might have uh -huh. to put, you might have to put it in parentheses. Uh, there we go. So, uh, But thank you guys so much for watching. Go ahead, click subscribe if you haven't already. Click a like, comment down below, and we will see you guys in the next episode. See you guys. Bye-bye, y'all. Thanks for watching.